Okay. Um, so anyways, when it comes to the due dates, so we're, we're going to have, um, the only thing we have left to do is this research project, right? Um, and we have the second source report is due this week, just to make sure that you're, you're on track with your source reports, right? That you're kind of on track with your research, everything that you're going through. And then next week is our last regular week of classes. I mean, that's the last week that I'll have like my, my regular office hours, but I'm going to be available all week next week. So if there's any time that you need to meet with me, if there's any days where you have questions about um, your research project, if you need a draft of your research project, a piece of it that you have, uh, talk about a source, anything like that at all, I'm available pretty much all day, most every day next week, right? Um, so that means I won't just be like sitting here on Zoom. I will be on both Monday and Tuesday, um, or excuse me, on Monday and Thursday, but just shoot me an email. I'll be at my computer. Um, I'll be finishing up grading your third essays try to get everything kind of like organized to get ready to grade the research projects. Um, but if there's any questions that you have at all, just go ahead and let me know. Um, and I can meet with you and we can talk about them. And like I said, just send me an email and I'll make the time available to meet with you on Zoom at any time that works for you. Or I, we can bounce ideas back and forth um, through email if that works. But I think working through Zoom and being able to like see the stuff that you're working on uh, will make it a lot easier. So that'll be next week. That's our last regular week, right? Um, I'm not going to give you anything that's due next week, um, but I am going to have the research project is going to be due during our finals week. So typically when we have classes that are face-to-face, -face, there's a final schedule for face-to-face -face classes. And there's also the same final schedule for online classes. Um, for a class like English 1, on the when we have face-to-face -face classes, I do have a day where we meet with the, for the final and we kind of like present on our research projects. It doesn't really work well to do that online, especially because our class is not a synchronous class. Um, so I can't expect people who weren't required to be in a regular class to show up to, to a scheduled final. So the only thing that we have to do for our final for this class is your research project is due during finals week. I'm gonna make your research project due on Wednesday, the 16th of December, um, which is right smack in the middle of that finals week. Um, and but if you turn it in earlier fantastic and then um i'll have it due on the 16th and then what will happen is i'll grade those um i have to have them graded within the last day of the semester is the 18th and i have to have my grades turned in right after that pretty much immediately after that so i'm just going to be grading the research papers off of a rubric um so you'll just get maybe some feedback within the rubric from me and then the rubric will be graded and you'll be able to see kind of like in the different categories of, of how the grading was broke down and I'll post a copy of that rubric next week. But if you want me to give you any detailed feedback on your research project beyond me grading them on the rubric, um, then just let me know and I'm happy I can meet with you individually on Zoom if you want to and I can go through your grade with you on your research project and kind of like explain your grade and talk to you about like why you earned the points that you did and, and answer any questions that you have, or um, I can just provide you detailed feedback through Canvas and then you can see it that way. But just because at the end of the semester, the turnaround is really quick, I wanna give you a few extra days. Typically when we're face-to-face, -face, I have the research project actually due the week before finals week. So it gives me time to be able to have those graded and then you'd be able to present on those at the end of the semester. Instead, this semester, because of you know the situation that we're in online, I'm giving you into finals week to turn into the research project. But that means that my turnaround has to be really fast to have these graded, to have final grades submitted before the deadline that I have to have grades submitted. So again, if you'd like to have detailed feedback on your research project, just let me know and I'm happy to do that. We can meet on Zoom and talk all about it. So the research projects, I'll be posting this on Canvas, um, are gonna be due the 16th of December. And so that means from here on out, that's all we have left to work on, right? Um, is that uh, this week, I'm gonna talk a little bit about today about the structure of putting in the research project. And then um, next week, I'm gonna be available all throughout the week. I'll also post an example of a research project for you to look at. I, I think that could be helpful to just see uh, a pretty strong version of a project that I got from a student, I think last semester or the previous semester. So I might post one or two different examples on there. I'll definitely post one, but I might post like two or three different examples on there just to kind of give you some idea of some of the stuff that students have submitted in the past. Uh, to, for me, it's always really helpful to be able to see a model of something. So I'll post that uh, for this upcoming week on Canvas for you to be able to look at. Are there any questions at all about the due date? 
or anything at all with the, the end of the semester, kind of leading up to the 16th. So basically, once I have it open, and I want to give you the opportunity to have this done early, because I know that like, for a lot of classes, um, you know, you might have like for English classes, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have, you know, a, a final like a final exam on the day of like a final paper is typically what most instructors do, if not all of us. Um, but I know that there are going to be some classes where you're going to have some pretty intense finals, right? Maybe some of your science classes, your math classes, history classes, things like that. So I want to give you the opportunity <clears throat> to be able to turn this in early if you need that, right? Because if this is something that you can kind of clear off of your plate before your, your final schedule starts and before maybe you're taking like a really intense chemistry final that you're studying for or something like that, then you can turn your research paper in next week, right? And then you'd be you'd be done with our class for the semester. So it's totally up to you, whatever works for your schedule, but you'll have up till Wednesday the 16th to be able to submit these, okay? All right, so if there's no questions, I'm gonna start talking a little bit about the structure. So let me share my screen with you and we'll take a look at this together. Okay, so this is, I posted this on Canvas. Um, just under this week's worth uh, work, this and I'm just going to kind of go over this and, and answer some questions as I'm along the way and um, kind of talk through some of these points to to think about how we can conceptualize the order of our research projects, right? Because I think this is a pretty effective way to be able to look at it. And uh, with the example that I'm going to be posting um, on Sunday evening uh, for Monday, you're going to be able to see that example of that student's writing of really kind of following a very similar structure to this, right? Um, so this is again just posted in this week's worth of work of Canvas, and it kind of breaks down what you should be doing in your introduction, what you could be doing in your body paragraphs, and then what your conclusion of this research project should do, right? Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over this, and again, if you have any questions as I'm going over it, like please don't hesitate to ask, and I'll kind of clarify some of these different points. But I didn't want to give you kind of like a, an outline that you fill in, but instead, like, here's the way that you should think about each of these points. Here's kind of a way to think about writing the intro for this. Here's what you think about, like, the jobs that should get done for the body paragraphs. And here's what you think about doing for the conclusion. So for your introduction, right, make sure that you're defining your community and the specific problem that affects the members of your community. And this is why I had you do that, like, in your proposal, right? Like, who is the community that you're focusing on? Are you focusing on, you know, all college students? Are you focusing on a specific uh, neighbor or, you know, city or state? Are you focusing on a specific demographic? A lot of students are writing papers about focusing on, on immigrants. If you're focusing on immigrants, is it a specific population? Is it a specific age from a different country? Like what, what specific population are you focusing on, right? So that should be pretty clear to somebody after reading your introduction. It doesn't mean that your introduction has to start with that sentence, right? You don't have to be like, the community I'm focusing on is like, you don't have to do that. But instead, Think about in your introduction, I should understand as your reader or any other person who reads this paper, I should understand who the community is that you're focusing on, right? That's one of the things that should be accomplished in the introduction. This is really important to think about, right? That you're writing for a potential outsider to this community or somebody who does not understand the problem. And also most importantly, someone who has not done the research that you have. So in every other assignment this semester, I've read everything right, that I've assigned, right? And so I'm familiar with the readings, right? Because I picked the readings for this class. However, this research project, as I'm reading your source reports, I'm a complete outsider. I haven't developed the same level of expertise you have on the issue that you're exploring. I don't know the issue, you know, the articles that you're referencing. I don't know the community that you're referencing. There may be some chance that, that it could just be coincidence that I've read some of these same things or, or a resource that I might be familiar with. But I would say 95% of the resources that I'm going to come across are these, these papers that I'm going to come across. I'm an outsider into this paper. So this is really important because we've been kind of practicing this all semester, thinking about this idea of like you're writing for somebody who does not have a context for the issue that you're exploring. So this is where it's really important that you make sure that you build the context for your reader. Like if there's a specific term that's related to the issue you're exploring, make sure you define it for that reader, right? Make sure that you kind of explain the problem in enough detail where the reader fully understands the issue that you're going to be that you're going to be addressing. This is your introduction, right? So it's important that you don't need to go into the same level of detail as you would your other body paragraphs, right? Like you don't have to go into every single one of your points and go into a lot of detail as you're building that context, because that's what the body of your essay is going to do. 
But what you do need to do is make sure that like you're just giving enough to kind of like set the stage, so to speak, right? So that when the body paragraphs come later on, the reader has a context to be able to move from there. So one of the databases that's really helpful to help you put together the introduction is Gale, right? Um, if you're familiar with that, right, you should have used, are people familiar with using Gale? That was part of LR10 to, to look up stuff using the Gale database. Does that sound familiar to everybody? Yes, no, can unmute. I just want to see if I need to go over Gale or people are familiar with Gale. Yes. Good, okay. I just wanted to make sure that like that was familiar. So if you use Gale, Gale's really helpful as you're searching a specific issue, right? Because what it will do is it'll um, give you a context for whatever that issue is that you're exploring. So that could be really helpful to use some like something from Gale to help you build your, your introduction. You don't need to, it's just a specific introduction that's really helpful there. Um, so you can really strengthen one of the things that we talked about this semester is utilizing rhetoric, right? And remember that idea of like persuasive language. And you could really strengthen your introduction by utilizing some sort of like either ethos, pathos or logos, right? Like one of those ideas of like the rhetorical modes of persuasion, right? So just that idea of like, can you add, like, there are some students uh, that I've read their proposals that are focusing on homelessness. Well, like, if you're describing the situation that, that somebody who's experiencing homelessness can be in, that can add a lot of emotion to your writing, right? So really think about that in your introduction as you're kind of defining the problem that you're exploring, that you might want to think about, like, can I kind of question ethics in here? Can I appeal to the reader's sense of emotion in my introduction? Like, and we practice that a lot. And there's some really great examples that you've all done over the semester of doing that in the hooks of your essay and kind of really bringing the reader into these ideas and like grabbing the reader. And emotionally is another really effective way of being able to do that. And then also make sure that your thesis statement contains a, a clear, or excuse me, your intro contains a clear thesis statement or Sometimes in research, instead of a thesis, there can actually be a question that you can ask. Typically throughout the semester, it's one of those places where I was like, ah, maybe don't ask a question for your thesis. But sometimes your thesis may be coming from a place of like, you genuinely don't know. And as you research the issue, that's what you're gonna be kind of figuring out the answer to. So it's like, maybe you identify, like let's say for example, for uh, some of the students who are focusing on like housing insecurity, maybe you identify that like, you know, the rising cost of houses in the Bay Area is creating housing insecurity. And then the question will be is like, how are people faring or how is it affecting people in the Bay Area through these increases in housing costs? Maybe you don't know the answer. Like, I don't know the answer. I have some guesses, right? But my research paper would probably be focused on identifying some sort of answer to that question. So you could make it a statement where you create an argument, right? Arguing the specific problem and how you see the uh, members of that community are affected or a question that can say like, you know, what is the cause of this problem? Like, for example, I see that in Fairfield, right? Like homelessness in Fairfield is becoming an, an increasingly severe problem. And one of the things that I think about when I look at that is like, what's creating that? Like, I have no idea, right? Again, I have some guesses, but based off of research, based off of like quality evidence, I don't know. And what's the solution for homelessness in Fairfield? I, I don't know, right? Like, I know that something needs to be done. I know that people need support, people need help. But I would ask that as a genuine question in my introduction, as in like, I don't know what the solution is or what the causes of this problem are, but throughout this paper, I'm gonna figure this out, right? And, my, and these sources that I'm researching are going to help me do that. So that's really important for your intro. These intros are gonna be longer, right? This paper should be a, 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 about five pages at the minimum, right? And so you would think that like for this, intro, it would be no problem to write a, an introduction. It's a page to, you know, a page and a half long, right? That's totally appropriate for this paper, but definitely I don't think you could tackle this introduction in less than three quarters of a page. Any questions at all about putting in the intro for this essay? All right, so let's talk body paragraphs. And again, this is all stuff that next week, right? Like, or this week as you're working, 
Next week, I'm going to be available again all throughout the week. So if there's any times you'd like to meet with me, let me read through stuff, read through your intro when you have it written, you know, talk to you about like where you are in your writing, even read a final draft of research project before you turn it in. I'm happy to do all that, right? But as you're working, like make sure that you're checking in with me and we'll be able to work through this because you'll have the whole week and then into next week to, to work on this, to have it submitted um, by that deadline of, of the 16th, right? So body paragraphs, I broke these up into two categories. The first part is identifying the community and presenting the problem. And the second part of the body of this essay should be solutions to the problem. I imagine that this body, you're gonna probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six body paragraphs for this essay, right? Um, this is where the bulk of your essay is going to be. So the first ones could be, you know, two, three body paragraphs somewhere in there for identifying the community and presenting the problem. So here's what you should do in these body paragraphs. Your first body paragraphs this research project should address identifying the community and the observed problem in more detail. So your introduction kind of hit on it a little bit. Now is where you're diving into it specifically, right? So for example, um, a student in one of our classes is, is writing about um, mental health issues uh, related to the LGBTQ community, right? And so I would say, okay, define that community. What are some of the issues that they're experiencing, right? Like make sure that your reader has a context for that. That could be one of the body paragraphs in this section here. Also, you need to convince your reader of the severity of this problem. This is really important. So make sure that you're using outside sources throughout these body paragraphs. Every body paragraph or almost every body paragraph should be supported by research. This is gonna help you build strong ethos and logos. Meaning it's one thing for me to say, this is a problem. It's another thing for me to find evidence-based research or evidence-based articles through our databases to support that, right? It's like, that's why we see people use evidence all the time. That's why you see people use things like testimonials. That's why when you're getting ready to, I don't know, if I was gonna be selling you a product, right? And I'm always gonna say like, oh, you should, you know, I like, we can see it happens right here with this book, right? Like right on the cover of Trevor Noah's book, there's evidence of the quality of this book. Because look, right down here, USA Today says it's soul nourishing pleasure, an enormous gift, right? So like right out of the gates, you're seeing that people are always trying to quantify the statements that they're making with evidence, right? And so that's true of your body paragraphs. Every argument that you're making throughout this essay becomes substantially stronger if you're supporting it with the research that you've done leading up to this point and helping you build on the research project. So these aren't your opinions on this issue. This isn't, here's what I think is a problem, or I was driving through Fairfield and here's what I saw. This is evidence-based, right? This is, here is what the research is saying about this. Here's what I'm seeing in my community. And here's how these two things are supporting each other. Does that make sense? So all the body paragraphs that you're adding in this, body, in this essay, you should be supporting them with the research that you've been, that you've been working on. So, Right? The reason that we correct, kind of collected all this research is to convince the reader that our arguments are and that the stronger you connect your ideas to the sources you gathered, the stronger your claims will be. Right, And again, we see that people doing that all the time. Right, The stronger their argument is, the stronger it's based in data, the stronger it's based in research, the stronger it's based in what somebody else has to say. Right, So each body paragraph, again, supported by strong examples and analysis. Now, these can be personal examples of things that you've seen, right? I'm not saying that you can't use the personal experience in here, but the personal experience, just like when we're using those in other essays, we're still supporting them with evidence from the readings. And in this case, you'll be supporting them with evidence from the research that you've been doing. And your body paragraphs should build on one another. The relationships and the purpose of them and the order should be clear to your reader, right? Like, Maybe this shows the community. Maybe this shows one problem. This shows another problem. So like in addition to identifying the community, you should be presenting the problem, right? Like that should be really clear. And maybe it's a two-part problem or a three-part problem, or maybe it's a singular issue, right? But that's what the early body paragraph should do. And again, this should be at the minimum two and somewhere around three or four body paragraphs to be able to tackle this part. Any questions on this first part of the body of the essay? Um, are you saying the just presenting the problem and the community should be three or four paragraphs? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Right, because it's going to be more than one issue related to the problem. I mean, it could be it could be done in three, two at the absolute minimum, but they have to be pretty detailed, robust paragraphs. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it'd probably be about like, I imagine around like three paragraphs for this part. Okay. I just wanted a little clarification on that. that was all. Yeah. So the next part of the body of this essay, right, will be the solutions to the problem. And if it helps you to organize this, if you wanted to put headings in your essay, I'd be fine with that, right? I don't think you need to, but if just for you, it helps if you were to say like, you know, after your introduction, if you were to go like identifying the community and then write that, and then after that, like presenting the problem and then write your body paragraphs, if that helps you from an organizational standpoint and then have one that says solutions, that's totally fine. I know it's a little bit different than what we've been doing writing wise, but sometimes when the essay gets a little bit bigger and you see that too in your research where they're like, you know, here's the abstract, here's the introduction, here's the procedure, here's the results, right? Like we see that sometimes in writing and it's totally fine if you wanna do it in this essay. So if that helps you feel more organized to just have these kind of like bold headings throughout these different points in your body to split your body up into two parts or three parts of like identifying the community, presenting the problem and solutions to the problem, totally fine. So the solutions to the problem section, this again should be probably like, you know, a, a very approximately about three body paragraphs also, right? The remaining body paragraphs of your research project should present solutions that you've researched, right? So do you think the early part of the body paragraphs are, here's what the problem is, the next part, here's what the solutions are, right? Each of your solutions should be supported by research, right? So maybe, I don't know, if, if, if you're focusing on the idea of, of um, I don't know, college students who, who are uh, protected by uh, DACA, for example, you could say mm -hmm. maybe one of the solutions you found is creating a, a, a dreamer center on college campuses to support students when they have questions or issues. Maybe if you're focusing on homelessness, one of the solutions that you found is being able to do, um, I don't know, uh, rehabilitation centers, right? That whatever it is, that would be one of your body paragraphs. I'm sure for each of these issues, you're gonna find two, three different solutions that you think could be viable, but you, here's where you'd be presenting them. Every solution that you put, same thing, you gotta make sure that you're supporting it with research. For example, you may have found sources to describe or support programs or structures that can be applied to your community on a larger scale, right? So let's say, for example, you read about something that maybe is happening. It doesn't even seem like it relates to your community, right? I remember last semester, a student was focusing on, on homelessness in the Bay Area. And one of the articles he found was about um, what I think was happening in like New York. like, And what was happening in this program was that like there was like, like a beautification process happening in the city where people were being hired to do days work to work in some of like local city parks and do some cleaning up and do like some kind of like light work throughout the park. And then people were being like provided with, with a daily income and they were being provided with different resources, like meals throughout the day. And he was like, I think this is something that we should be doing in all cities, right? Across the country. And we could be doing this in Fairfield. And so it was just one of those places where it doesn't have to be like, the solution you found relates directly to your community. You can find something that's happening in another country and another state, wherever, and say like, oh, we could be doing this and explain how this could be a solution that works in the community that you've identified, right? Um, make sure that you're drawing a connection between what you've read and your argument, right? So remember, the reader has not read the same articles that you have. So it's really important that you provide enough detail and analysis so that reader can clearly see the connection. So if you said, here's a solution to this problem in this community, make sure that I see as your reader how this solution that you're putting out there relates to the community you've established earlier. So people are really critical, right, of potential solutions. That's just kind of the way that it goes, right? Like a lot of times people are going to say, oh, it's too expensive or, oh, it's too hard or, or oh, there's drawbacks or there's, you know, uh, it's too hard to scale, right? I mean, think about any kind of solution to a problem. Like that happens on campus all the time. I'll be in a meeting and I'm like, hey, here's a way that we can fix this. And they're like, yeah, but that's gonna be really expensive to do. Or yeah, but that's gonna take a lot of work to be able to do, right? Some of these solutions that you might find will be really, really expensive to think about how we'd be able to, to implement them. Some of them can seem like a lot of work. So one of the things that you might wanna think about is, these are going to be what are called counter arguments, right? This idea that like somebody is, is saying that like, here's the opposite of this. And then you would say, okay, to help you develop the body paragraph, 
think about somebody having, think about there being kind of like a naysayer, somebody that you have to convince why this is important that we do this, right? So think about that idea of like, should we acknowledge this counter argument? Is it valid? Does it make one of the solutions impractical or not, right? Sometimes there could be solutions that are just impractical, right? That like, I don't know, like I would say, like if we think about that with class size. I mean, what if we had English ones that were a class size of 10? I mean, think about the time that an instructor would be able to give to a student, right? Think about the, the community you'd be able to build in a, in a classroom of 10. And for some of you, like you know, when you're in graduate programs, you'll be in classes like that, where there's like 10 people in there. And I've had classes where it's like, I was in a class of six and it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever had in school, but it's not a practical model, right? It's way too expensive. There would have to be a, hundreds of English one teachers for us to be able to pull that off, right? And so like, if I were to look at that, I would say, yeah, that would be great but is that a practical solution? However, there could be other things where I would say like, yeah, there's a practical a solution that would work really well. And yeah, there could be drawbacks that could be expensive, but it's essential that we do this because it's worth that potential drawback or it's worth that extra money. So if you kind of think about what somebody who would be a naysayer would say about this issue, that would be a nice way to help you really develop your idea out and saying something like implementing this program could be very expensive. However, the amount of money that it could save in the long run or the way that it could help people, right? It's like building housing, across, especially in California, to be able to help people who are experiencing housing insecurity is expensive, right? Very, very expensive. Hundreds of millions, if not into billion dollar endeavors. But it's money that we should be spending in a community from my perspective, right? So it's like, just because it's expensive doesn't mean that we don't do it. And so I think that that's one of those things where it's really up to you to kind of think about like, how would you address somebody who would say, ah, I don't think this solution is the best idea. And one of the things that you might find, especially when we like last time we looked at pro and con database is you might find one article that says this is a really great solution. You might find another article that says this doesn't work, right? And, and in fact, I found that like um, when it comes to just because that idea, like a lot of people are writing about housing insecurity or homelessness, that that was one of the things like cities like New York have um, laws in place where people are have a, what's called the right to shelter, right? So there's like apartment complexes, hotels, things like that. And there's some people who are very, who think that's a great idea, people who are experts in the field. And there's other people that says, no, 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 right to shelter is a horrible law and that there's a lot of controversy around it. And so you might find within your field that there could be experts on both sides of the issue fighting it, right? Just like they are right now, right? Like if we're talking about like whether or not kids should return to school, there's experts who are arguing they should be allowed to, and there's experts who are arguing they shouldn't be allowed to, right? And so just because like an expert is saying something, there might be a whole other side where they're going to be arguing the exact opposite. So you might be able to find kind of a little bit of both on that specific issue. Any questions about that piece? So same thing here, right? Body paragraphs supported by strong examples and analysis, right? That's really important. And that idea of like building on each other. So this last piece then, this is just your, right, the body paragraphs, we've identified the community, we've presented the problems, and now we're kind of like breaking down, here's what some solutions are. So the conclusion for this essay is quite simply, for this project, you should identify the best possible solution for the problem you've identified, right? And that's it. They're breaking and then your analysis of your conclusion should be, and this could be like, you know, three quarters of a page, something like that, uh, half a page at the minimum, right? But probably about a page at the maximum. So is the solution practical? How could it be implemented? How would it affect the community? What will the community look like after this solution is carried out, right? So if I really think about that idea and I say, hey, you know, one of the things that we need to create, I think the best possible solution for, for you know, homelessness in the Bay Area is, you know, assigning caseworkers and providing, you know, to be able to provide both like emotional, psychological and financial support, right? Then I would say in my conclusion, what would the community look like if that existed? How would the community be affected by adding that, right? And that's kind of where you're drawing out that like, if in a perfect world, here's what we would do and here's how we could address the issue and here's how that community would be changed because of that. Any questions at all on that conclusion or any of the structure of the research project?
so the structure, I mean, seems, I would hope, pretty straightforward, right? Like, does it feel that way? Are there any moments that, that feel unclear? Anything that feels kind of like overwhelming or, or that you have some, some doubt or some questions about? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay. So if people do have questions, um, I'm still here, right? I, I can hang out in Zoom. I can answer any individual questions you might have about the project. Um, and then this whole, you know, the remainder of this week, the only thing you have to do is that second source report. And then next week, um, the only thing I'll have is just, I'm just going to be posting on Canvas. I'll give a, a couple examples or so of a research project, at least at least one, but maybe two or three examples. I'm just going to kind of dig around on previous assignments and see some strong ones that I can find. Um, I'll post those. And then in addition to that, I'll be available all throughout the week to be able to meet with people. So next week, for sure, if you have questions, if you want me to read some stuff that you've written, if you want to talk to me about a specific paragraph you're developing, if you feel stuck, right? If it's like, eh, I don't really know where to go. I don't, I, I'm not able to even get started in my introduction. Like, please talk to me because the rest of next week and into next Wednesday or the Wednesday after that, when this is due is just simply time to work on your research project, time to meet with me individually, and we can go through and start, you know, talking about this in some detail, looking at some different samples of your writing, and then giving you some feedback from there.